Um, today's sermon, we've got Greg Steer. He is the founder of Dare to Share. If you've never heard of this awesome ministry, he has a heart for equipping and mobilizing the generation of today, the teens, the youth. But not only that, he is a passionate speaker, a passionate a communicator about the gospel of Jesus. He has been with Jesus and knows what it means to walk with him. And he wants to make sure that we all know and taste and see the goodness of God too. He's actually one of Pastor Derwin's very close friends. They actually met back in 2000 when Pastor Derwin first started his uh, public speaking ministry. And I've got something to share with you that I just learned this week. This is really great. I heard that Pastor Derwin used to do skits with him, like to prepare for his Dare to Share speaking engagement. So I think if you Google, I know it's kind of funny, right? If you Google it, he didn't know I was gonna share this, but if you Google it, I'm sure we can find uh, one or two videos of Pastor Derwin doing some awesome skits back in 2005. Uh, But with all that to say, uh, we're excited uh, for Greg to be here with us and to share his heart and to share his passion. And so TC family, welcome Greg Steer. Good morning. So excited to share with you today and uh, grateful to be here at Transformation Church. Uh, Pastor Derwin is one of my heroes in the faith, one of my closest friends. 15 years ago, I watched a video called The Evangelism Linebacker. And those of us in youth ministry were exposed to Derwin Gray tackling kids who were not sharing the gospel of Christ. And somebody told me later, that dude can preach. And so they sent me a link and I'm like, he can preach. So I invited him on tour with us for two years at Dare to Share, trained tens of thousands of teens how to share the gospel. And Pastor Derwin became the tour pastor and uh, became one of my closest friends. Thank God for Pastor Derwin Gray. I love the guy. Let me tell you, let me tell you what makes... Pastor Derwin, such an effective preacher, uh, is not his turns of phrases or his illustrations. It's not even his excellent exegesis or his fine dance moves. What makes him an excellent preacher is he believes in the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in every sermon, you're gonna get to the cross of Christ. You're gonna get to the answers. That's what changes everything. The gospel changes everything. It heals the hurting and encourages the hopeless. It saves the sinner and sanctifies the saint. It breaks down the walls that divide us and builds up the love that unites us. The gospel changes everything. I've seen it in my family. Uh, I've seen it in my life. Uh, And I, I actually just wrote a book about it. It's called Unlikely Fighter. And the tagline is the story of how a father of the street kid overcame violence chaos and confusion to become a radical Christ follower. It's 22 chapters long, but the first 21 chapters happened before I turned 16 years of age. And I'll tell you how I was able to overcome that. It wasn't me, it was Christ. It was the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I don't come from a typical religious, church-going, pew-sitting, hymn-singing family. I come from a family filled with bodybuilding, tobacco chewing, beer drinking thugs. And that's just the women, sadly. But seriously, (laughs) three of my uncles were competitive bodybuilders. The fourth one was a bouncer at the toughest bar in Denver. The fifth one was a Golden Gloves boxer, judo champion, and war hero. I was at the bottom of the gene pool, obviously. Uh, The Denver Mafia, there was a mafia in Denver called the Small Dones. The Denver Mafia nicknamed my uncles the Crazy Brothers. So when the mafia thinks your family's dysfunctional, that is not good. And the toughest one of my uncles was my Uncle Jack. We got a picture of my Uncle Jack right here. Check, check out that picture of Uncle Jack. That's Uncle Jack, just so you don't think I'm exaggerating. He only weighs 185 pounds in that picture, and 85 of those pounds are in that right bicep that he's admiring. He looks a little like the Wolverine, I think. Anyway, he was in and out of jail his whole life, once for choking two cops unconscious at the same time. A very bad, very dangerous very angry man. But one day, God sent somebody unlikely into his life. There was a hillbilly preacher from the deep south who, for some reason, his nickname was Yankee. I think we've got a picture of Yankee, too. Uh, Yankee, this hillbilly preacher who planted a church in the suburbs of Denver, had a guy going to his church named Bob Daly. Bob Daly was a Christian. Bob Daly knew my family. Bob Daly was too afraid to share the gospel with Uncle Jack, so he dared Yankee to do it. Yankee was fearless. So this unlikely preacher comes down to Jack's door, knocks on his door. Jack comes to the door, no shirt on, tats everywhere, 
two beer cans, one for drinking beer, one for spit and chew. He didn't want to get those mixed up. So what do you want? He said, I'm here on, my name's Yankee Arnold. I'm here on a dare from Bob Daly to tell you about Jesus. He goes, I don't know Jesus. I know Bob. I'll give you five minutes. Invites him in. Yankee explains the gospel. Not religion, but a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for the first time, it clicked. Yankee said, does that make sense? Jack said, hell yeah. That was a sinner's prayer. It was hell yeah. And have you ever met a new believer that doesn't know the rules about loving your enemies? That was Jack, because he started telling people about Jesus, and if they didn't take Jesus, he may give them Moses right upside their head, right? One day in a sauna, he's sharing the gospel with another bodybuilder. Now, you gotta understand something. When you're in a sauna, you got no clothes on. This is buck naked evangelism he's doing right there, sharing the gospel with another bodybuilder. Another guy, another bodybuilder from a different religion starts to interrupt and start to argue with my Uncle Jack. Jack doesn't know the rules about loving your enemies. He goes, hey, I'm trying to tell him about the love of Jesus. Why don't you shut your stinking mouth? He continues to share the gospel. The guy interrupts again. He goes, yo, you interrupt me again? I'm taking you out. He continues to share the gospel. The guy interrupts again. Bam, Jack hits this guy. The guy falls to the ground, looks up and goes, Jesus didn't go around hitting people like that. He goes, well, I ain't Jesus. I'm Jack. Didn't know the rules yet. But let me tell you, Jack was transformed. In that moment, he came to Christ. He literally brought 250 people out to church in one month. He invited 250 people out, and they all came out, right? Let me tell you, the power of the gospel changes everything. I could tell you story after story after story, and it all goes back to this unlikely preacher Nicknamed Yankee, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love that concept of unlikely, unlikely fighter. When I think of unlikely fighter, I think of my, old, my favorite Old Testament story, the story of David and Goliath, 1 Samuel 17. For those of you who are not familiar with that story, let me just recap it for you. David, a teenager, is commissioned by his father to deliver cheese and crackers to his older brothers in the war. He goes to the Valley of Elah, and on one side of the Valley of Elah, there are the Philistines. On the other side, the Israelites. And every morning and every night for 40 days and 40 nights, out comes a giant named Goliath who taunts the armies of the Israelites to send out their best fighter to fight him. And nobody takes him up because he's huge and he's tough. Well, David overhears his taunts, and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God. I'll fight him. He goes to Saul. They tried dressing him in Saul's armor. It doesn't quite fit. He goes, you know what? I'm going like who God made me. I'm a shepherd. I'm gonna go fight him like a shepherd. What does a shepherd have? His stick and a sling. He gets five rocks from the brook, puts them in his bag, goes out to face down this giant named Goliath. Goliath sees this kid, this teenager, and he's insulted. He says, what am I, a dog? Did you come at me with sticks? Come here, kid. I'll give your body to the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. And David delivers my favorite Old Testament comeback. He says, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord God Almighty. Today, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna cut off your head and I'm gonna give the carcasses of the entire Philistine army to the beasts of the field and the birds of the air. And this day, the world will know there is a God in Israel. Let's get it on. He didn't say that last part, but he should have. And he runs toward Goliath, grabs a rocket, swings that sling, throws that stone. That rock drills into Goliath's skull. He dies on his feet falls to the ground. David cuts off his head, raises it up to the sky, and all the adult Israeli soldiers who were hiding in their foxholes catapult out with a shout and chase the Philistines down. And God brings about a mighty victory through an unlikely fighter. So here's what I want to share with you today. Here is my big idea. God uses unlikely fighters to face unbeatable giants so he can accomplish an unimaginable Victory. Unlikely fighters. The Bible is full of unlikely fighters. 
God used a novice boat builder named Noah, an elderly patriarch named Abraham, a stuttering shepherd named Moses, a teen queen named Esther, a confident senior citizen named Caleb, a God-fearing prostitute named Rahab, a young dreamer named Daniel, a fig pig and prophet named Amos, a girl crazy warrior named Samson, a prejudiced preacher named Jonah, a determined cupbearer named Nehemiah, a cricket-eating, camel-for-wearing, water-drenched madman named John the Baptist. God loves to use unlikely fighters. David was an unlikely fighter. He was too unknown. He was a shepherd. He was too inexperienced. He wasn't a soldier. He wasn't a warrior. He was too young. David was most likely a young teenager when he fought Goliath. And so many times, just as a side note, let me just say this. I work with Dare to Share because I believe in the power and potential of teenagers. I believe that God loves to use unlikely teenagers to make a huge difference. Every major spiritual awakening in the history of the United States has had teenagers on the leading edge of that awakening. If we miss teenagers, we miss the movement. And one of the reasons I love Pastor Derwin, he's got a heart for teenagers, because I've heard him preach and address, hey teens, I'm gonna talk to you. He treats teenagers not like they have the junior Holy Spirit, but the real Holy Spirit. And we must train, equip, and mobilize these teenagers to live and give the gospel. Unlikely fighters. David was an unlikely fighter. I was too. Here I am raised in this family full of bodybuilders and street thugs. I was fatherless, result of a short-term sexual trice my mom had with a dude she met at a party. Didn't know my background, didn't know I fit into this crazy family. I was like young Sheldon in the hood. I was actually. One day at a Christmas party, all my uncles, aunts, cousins, opening presents at my grandparents' house. They're about to break for lunch. My Uncle Dave, now Uncle Dave is a war hero. 40 medals and commendations, judo champion, a golden gloves boxer, a man's man. He says, before we dismiss for lunch, I got one more present, it's for little Greg. I'm six years old. I'd never been called out like this. I'm standing in the corner and I walk across the room with six-year-old swagger, right? For the first time, I'm being noticed in my family and my Uncle Dave in front of all my family gives me this present and I open it up and it's a girl's doll. And I don't understand, I think it's a mistake. I go, it's a girl's doll. He goes, yeah, I figured you don't have a dad, so you like to play with dolls like a little girl. I got angry, I shoved it in his stomach. I go, ain't no girl, and I walk back to my corner. And all my uncles are like, well, you see, maybe he's a temper after all. Maybe he's one of us after all. Let me tell you something. I, I knew right then, in this downward spiral, I knew my fight. I knew my fight. My fight was that of identity. Who am I, and how did I get in this family? Why am I here? What's your fight? You see, you're an unlikely fighter too. And God has a penchant to use the unlikely. God specializes in it. If you feel unusable, God can use you. If you feel like you're not special, God has a special place for you. If you feel like you're too poor or too weak or too sinful or too unpopular or too whatever, God is more than too excited to use you because when he does, he will get the maximum glory. God uses unlikely fighters to face unbeatable giants. David's giant seemed unbeatable. 1 Samuel 17, 4, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits and a span. Let me translate that for you. He was nine foot six inches tall. He could not play basketball because his head would get stuck in the net. This is a huge man. He was a Philistine champion, which means he had killed hundreds, if not thousands, in the course of war. David's giants seemed unbeatable by human standards. The giants we face may seem unbeatable. What giant are you facing? Maybe it's a giant sin in your life. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Maybe it's a giant problem in your marriage. You know, 25 years ago, I was pastoring a church and leading Dare to Share. I was busy. About five or six years into my marriage, my marriage was a hot mess. 
One night on the way to Bible study, my wife and I get into this raging argument. We pull up, I'm like, put on a happy face, we're going in. And my wife is sweet and kind, but she's also a redhead. So she put on a happy face and went in. And that night, thank the Lord, I was not leading the Bible study. Pastor Green, the associate, was leading the Bible study. And we were in the big Bible study circle. And he goes, you know what? Tonight, instead of going through the Bible study, let's just go around the room and get real and raw and honest. I'm like, oh, no. So he gets around the room, gets to me. How's it going, Pastor Steer? I'm like, you know, I've been busy with the church and dare to share and quite busy. Just pray I can find that ministry life balance. I'm trying to spin it. Gets to my wife. Now, you gotta know, my wife does not like to speak in public, let alone pray in public or anything in public, right? She's quiet. He said, how's it going, Debbie? She goes, not good. And everybody looked up. He goes, what's going on? She goes, my husband's gone every weekend. He's gone every night. And when he's home, he's got nothing left for me. I can't take it. I can't fake it anymore. My husband's a jerk. I go, you wanna do this right now in front of God and everyone? Well, let's get it on. And so we start arguing with each other and everybody in the Bible study thinks it's a skit. It's not a skit. It's real. And halfway through, Pastor Green makes the mistake of interrupting and taunting me. He goes, I'll tell you something, man. I don't care if you're the pastor of the largest church in the world. I don't care if Dare to Share blows up all over the world. If you don't take care of business at home, you're nothing. Well, he'd been ticking me off in staff meeting anyway. So I stand up. I go, yeah, you may be right. But I'm about to take you out. Woo! And I ran across the room. No kidding. Ran across the room. I figured, you know what? I believe in eternal security. I'm taking him out, right? And right in the middle of the room, I hit my giant. Because I knew he was right and she was right and I was wrong. And I collapsed in a pool of tears and began to weep like I've never wept before or since. For 30 minutes, I could not stop crying. Which led to another awkward moment. Like, there were people who were like, what do we do? This is our pastor. Do we call the Catholics and have them send a priest? Is this an exorcism type situation? They didn't know what to do. Let me tell you, that moment saved my marriage because everybody knew my giant. I tied it into the sermon. Perhaps you heard through the prayer chain about my meltdown, and they did. You know, yeah, we know your, your marriage is a mess. The older couples came and poured into us and minister to us, thank God for a grace-fueled church. What's that giant you're facing? Maybe it is a giant problem in your marriage. Maybe it's a giant financial crisis, addiction, bitterness. Name that giant. Name that giant in your soul right now. Because you cannot crucify what you refuse to identify. Identify that giant. See, God uses unlikely fighters to face unbeatable giants so he can accomplish an unimaginable victory. The unimaginable victory that comes through his name. There's something about a name. Like in North Denver, there was something about my family name. It wasn't Steer, that's my name. My family name was Matthias. We were in the highest crime rate area of our city and people would mess with me until they realized I was part of the Matthias family. Because there's something about that name. There's something about the name of God. 1 Samuel 17, 45, David tells Goliath, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You got all this weaponry, I got a name. I got a name, we have a name, the name of Jesus Christ, that victory that comes through his name that flowed from his shame. Hebrews 12, 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. On the cross, Jesus endured the ultimate shame, naked and twisted and dying. The creator of the universe, the one who spoke it into existence is now being crucified by his creation. And this is where we get the unlikely twist in the story of David versus Goliath. Here's the unlikely twist. Truly really not about David and Goliath. Truly really not about you and me facing our giants. The story of David and Goliath is about the ultimate unlikely fighter who 2,000 years ago left his throne in heaven and invaded time and space, 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became the Son of Man, fully God and fully human, yet without sin. He lived the perfect life we could never live. And then this Son of David, not in the Valley of Elah, but on a mountain called Calvary, waged the ultimate fight with sin and Satan. He was crucified on the cross. He yelled, Eloi, Eloi, lama sakbathani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, God the Father took all of his wrath and anger and hatred for all of our sin and poured it out in full measure on the body, the spirit, and the soul of Jesus. And he died in our place for our sins. And then he uttered the words that sent that rock, so to speak, hurtling at sin. It is finished. And sin fell dead on its feet. And there was an earthquake that shook and the veil in the temple tore from top to bottom because now we had access to God through the torn body of Jesus Christ our Lord. The ultimate victory, the almost unlikely fighter is Jesus Christ himself. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, how I wanted my ma to know that victory. Five street thug brothers, my ma, the only sister. She used a baseball bat. Saw her destroy a car and then destroy a guy with a baseball bat when I was five years old. Thinking to myself three things. Number one, I will never disobey my mommy again. Number two, how did that cigarette stay in her mouth the whole time? And number three, why is she so full of rage? It was a shame-fueled rage because when she got pregnant with me, she didn't want to stand before her strict Baptist parents. She got in the car and drove from Denver to Boston to have an illegal abortion. My Uncle Tommy and Aunt Carol talked her out of it. She came back in shame. She had me. When she would look at me, she'd often burst out in tears. I get saved. I go to Yankees Church where he trained us and equipped us how to share our faith as teenagers. The first person on my heart was my mom. From the time I was 12 to the time I was 15, I would lay the gospel out to my mom. And she said, you don't know the things I've done wrong. I knew them all because grandma had told me everything. I said, it doesn't matter, Ma. Jesus died for all your sins. Sitting at that table, my mom finally put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. She trusted in Jesus. The giant fell. Have you trusted in Jesus? I wanna share with you the same illustration that Yankees share with my Uncle Jack that I share with my mom. Pretend like this hand is you and me and everybody in the world. Pretend like this is God. God, he created us to be with him. He loves us so much. But our sins, they separate us from God. I love the Apple phone because it's got a bite taken out of this apple, which represents the forbidden fruit. When Adam and Eve sinned, we all sinned. As a result of that sin, we're condemned to die forever in a literal place called hell. And religion says, well, if you do these good deeds, it'll just, you know, it'll be good. Listen, good deeds are good, but they just cover up our sin. It's like putting white frosting on a burnt cake. So 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life we couldn't live and then died on the cross. When Jesus died, he took all of our sin upon himself, gave us his righteousness. He rose from the dead, proving he was God, and now he offers us eternal life. That life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever, and all you must do is put your faith and trust in him. If you trust in Jesus to save you, to forgive you, to give you eternal life, just like you're trusting in that chair to hold you up, you are saved. You have life. A life doesn't just mean you're gonna be in heaven someday. Life as a child of God, you get a new identity. It's life with the people of God, you get a new family. It's life for the mission of God, you get a new purpose. So if you've never put your faith in Jesus, the Bible says today is a day of salvation. We're not finished with the sermon quite yet, but I'm just gonna have us pause and bow our heads and close our eyes. And if you came here today and you can't say you know for sure your sins are forgiven, you're an adopted child of God, that you're gonna go to heaven someday and that you have a purpose in life today, 
If you don't know that for sure, you can know it. You can just trust in him right where you sit. You can say the silent prayer in your heart to God. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I fall short. But I believe that Jesus died for me. Paid the price for all my sins. That he rose from the dead. And I trust in him alone to forgive me for all my sins, past, present, and future, and to give me life, that new identity, that new family, that new purpose. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you just put your faith in Jesus, you're saved, not because you said a prayer, but because you trusted in Jesus. Jesus put it this way, I tell you the truth, if you trust in me, you have everlasting life. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around, if you just trusted in Jesus, can you simply raise up your hand and put it right back down? If you just put your faith in Christ and said that prayer with me, God bless all of you. God bless all of you. God bless all of you. If you made a decision to put your faith in Christ, Transformation Church team will let you know what to do at the end of the service, but we all know what to do as believers in Christ right now. Let's welcome these new family members to the family of God. Welcome in. And if you're a believer in Christ, let me just say this. My ma never fully experienced that freedom that was purchased through the blood of Christ even after she put her faith in Christ. She had doubts. When my ma died 17 years ago, actually 18 years ago this month, I was secretly glad because I knew for the first time she stood before the Lord, sin-free, guilt-free, and shame-free. Somebody asked me a few years later, how's your mom doing? They didn't know she died. I go, she's doing great. She stopped smoking, best shape of her life, worshiping all the time. She's dead. They're like, oh, you know what to do with that. <laughs> Believer, don't you dare live one more second on this earth in shame. Walk in victory, the victory that's purchased through Christ. <laughs> the unimaginable victory that comes through his name flows from his shame and results in his fame. Why did David kill Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 46 tells us, he says, so that the world will know there is a God in Israel. See, David knew that when the world heard about how the God of a shepherd boy was so powerful, he was able to infuse this shepherd boy with divine power to defeat a giant. He knew people would believe in the true God. This is the Old Testament version of evangelism. It results in God's fame. That's when we're ready to share that unimaginable victory with others. Are you ready to share your victory through Christ with others? When it comes to unlikely fighters who share their faith, I think of no one more unlikely than Doug. Doug came from a broken family. His life was in a downward spiral. As a teenager, he was rebellious. He was slow. Back in the 70s, kids with learning disabilities were just often called dumb. And kids were cruel to Doug. Doug had epilepsy. He could have a grand mal seizure any time of the day or night. Kids would mock him and Doug would fight back. He started getting expelled from school. He started getting in trouble with the law. His life was in a downward spiral, but then he had a head-on encounter with Jesus and Jesus changed everything. And I remember the change in Doug. Because Doug wanted to share that unimaginable victory that his giant had fallen with everybody. And it was awkward. He would just awkwardly bring it up. If somebody said, boy, it's hot in here, he'd say, it's hot in hell too. Let me tell you about Jesus. And he would, boo. And he would just go for it. I remember Doug would just walk around looking for people to talk to. One day early on a Saturday, he goes, let's go tell somebody about Jesus. I go, it's kind of early. He goes, people need the Lord. So we go out looking. Can't find anybody. Finally, we see about 100 yards away in this little park, an eight-year-old boy-ish playing on a jungle gym, and Doug goes, there's one, and he starts running at this kid going, hey, kid, where are you gonna go when you die? And the kid goes home and ran as fast as he could. I'm like, Doug, you scared that kid to death because I didn't mean to scare that kid. I want that kid to know Jesus. Saved of his money, took a bicycle all over the city streets of Denver, talking to hitchhikers, people at bus stops, pulled up to a stoplight, red light, car full of guys. He thinks they need Jesus. Knocks on their window, they roll down the window. He begins sharing the gospel. 
The light turns green halfway through. They said, we got to go, dude. He goes, well, I'm not done. I'm going with you. Holds onto the handle. The car takes off 10, 20, 30, 45 miles an hour. Doug's balancing himself, finishes the gospel. He says, I hope you believe. Peels off to safety. Later on, he tells me the story. I go, Doug, you're an idiot. You could have got sucked under those tires, run over and killed. He goes, it'd be worth it. It'd be worth it for those guys to know Jesus. Doug finally graduated from high school with his GED at 19 or 20. Saw a girl at a restaurant that was a server, thought she was beautiful, but had a strict I will not date an unbeliever policy. So he led her to Christ right there and then asked her out. She said yes. On like their first date, he goes, this is going great. We should get married. She thought he was joking. She goes, okay. Six months later, they got married. They moved from Denver, Colorado to Ankeny, Iowa, where for 30 years, Doug has been a custodian at a public school. And as a custodian in his public school, he strips and waxes the floors. You can see the joy of Christ on his face, right? He strips and waxes the floors and sings Christian songs. He would share Christ with the kids and with the teachers and with the administrators at a public school. And when the administrators would say, Doug, proselytizing is prohibited at a public school. He would think, I have no idea what the word proselytizing means. And prohibited sounds encouraged. So he's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> A few years back, Doug had to retire early because he got a form of dementia, started forgetting stuff. But one thing he has not forgotten is Jesus. Because about once a week, I get a call from Doug. And oftentimes, he tells me the latest story, the latest person he's told about Jesus Christ, his unimaginable victory through Jesus. And one day at the judgment seat of Christ, when Doug's name is called, there will be thousands who stand and applaud. And I'll be one of them. Because Doug is my big brother. He's seven years older than me. He watched my back in the hood. And I'm gonna tell you something. I realized as a kid, when I watched my brother, if he could share his faith, then I could share my faith. And if I could share my faith, then you can share your faith. Listen, you may feel unlikely. It's not about you. It's about the power of God in you. It's about the message of Christ through you. And how do you do that? Well, you know, you go to Transformation Church. You invite you invite, invite them out to Transformation Church because you know that Pastor Derwin is gonna give the gospel in every sermon. It's gonna be woven through whatever text he's preaching. He reaches into the dirt, the soil of the text and finds a scarlet cord and he'll follow it all the way to a bloody cross and he'll take you with them. Invite them to church. Invite them into a conversation. Ask them, how can I be praying for you? That opens the door right there. Maybe you wanna use this book, Unlikely Fighter. We have a lot of people using that as an outreach tool because the God talks about the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think of Kathleen, a couple months ago, her daughter bought her an Unlikely Fighter book. She read it. She put her faith in Christ and got baptized. She's 94 years old. Talk about cutting it close. I mean, she's in now, right? <laughs> but however you choose to do it, do something. And here's my challenge to you. Do something, listen to me, this week. This week. Maybe the next 24 hours. Because as Christians, we often talk about stuff. We love to have meetings. We have meetings about meetings. But the call is to be doers of the word and not hearers only. I think of Charles Spurgeon's words to his young preacher boys. Gentlemen, do something, do something, do something. When everybody else is talking about doing something, do something. When everybody's making committees and constitutions, do something. Our goal, gentlemen, is not to talk about saving souls, but to do it, and that for the glory of God. Do something this week to share your faith. God uses unlikely fighters. We're facing unbeatable giants. to bring about an unimaginable victory. It comes through his name. It flowed from his shame. And it results in his fame. Let's make Jesus famous this week. I wanna pray for you. I'm gonna ask you to keep your eyes open as I do. I wanna look into your eyes. Father, I pray for every one of these members of Transformation Church. I thank you for this church. I thank you what you're doing in them and through them. I thank you that this is a gospel advancing church. 
that's healing the broken, that's bringing races together, the multi-ethnic movement of gospel advancing, disciple multiplying, it's gonna change the world. It's gonna be a light on a hill in a world that's separated. I pray not just for this church collectively, I pray for every member and every participant of this church individually. Lord, would you help them to realize you have placed them at a job, in a community, in a family, to be a living witness, to be unlikely fighters, to declare the fame of Christ. Would you give them wisdom and boldness? Would you help them to preach the gospel, not just with their lives, but with their lips? May we be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Use Transformation Church in a bold way this week. In Jesus' name and all God's children said,
Amen, amen. Mm. Wow. Those words are so powerful. A reminder that God does not leave anyone behind, that as we go out and, and bear witness to what he's done, that he's actually good, right? That he actually does love us, that he cares for us, that he sees us. And that message that Greg shared today is a reminder that we get to be unlikely fighters because Jesus sent his self to die for us so that we could go out and be the hands and feet and tell others about a God who loved us, who sent his son. I'm so encouraged by that today and I hope that you are too. That message in that song messes me up every time. It's amazing. It's just, <laughs> it's so powerful. Uh, today's soul tattoo is let Jesus fight your battles. Let Jesus fight your battles, whatever you're walking through, whatever challenge or circumstance, whatever it is that, that you're facing that feels absolutely too overwhelming or too big, you can just lay at the feet of yes. Jesus. You can surrender it today. You don't have to bear the weight that you were never meant to carry. Y'all, that is really, really good news today. Really good news. Yeah, amen. It's really good news. Let Jesus fight your battles. And our action step is to invite your friends to that our awesome sermon series that we have coming up, Overcoming Discouragement. I do not know about you, but I need encouragement. Like, I, I don't just need encouragement. Let me be real. I need, like, truth. I need hope. I need, I need the thing that Jesus can only give us. And so in this sermon series, we're gonna walk through what Jesus, yeah. ooh, y'all, listen, what Jesus did on the road to Emmaus, how he offered his disciples a place of celebration in the midst of brokenness and hopelessness blows my mind every time. And so if you want, like, real transformational truth and, and encouragement, not just toxic positivity, yeah. right, where it's like, Things are fine. No, God is actually good. And in the sermon series, we're gonna talk about why he's good and why we get to hold hope in the midst of so much pain. Amen?